All right, well, I want to welcome everyone to Moving Modular Design Forward. This course is brought to you by the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to empower people to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. Today, I'll be your moderator. My name is Brett Little. This course is approved for multiple continuing education units, along with our own internal certified green home professional in the materials energy. And hey, we got to place one here today. And for AIA, um, uh, this one is LU only, so make sure to note that. And that may make it still applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. I'm real excited for a membership spotlight. I wanted to give a uh, shout out here to our member, Woody Gontina. That's his home there on the bottom right. And soon on the top, that's what it's going to look like. He is transforming his 1935 home into lead, into net zero. And he wants to tell... He wants to share his story with you all tomorrow night on the Michigan Solar Stories. He's going to be doing that. And then he's going to be doing a ton more filming after that. So check that out. You know, this is who our members are. This is what our members do. And so can you. You can sign up to become a member, get instant access to all of our courses, uh, paid uh, uh, discounts on trainings and green building certification and so much more. And before we get started, a thanks to our top tier sponsor, April Air. Help your clients stay healthy, humidity control, temperature control, air purity, water efficient humidification is a win for health and water conservation. Energy efficient dehumidification pairs with the right size heat pump can keep the air feeling cool and you can set points higher to save energy. You've got MERV 13 filtration. It captures particulates of growing concerns such as nasty airborne viruses going around, PM 2.5, which is coming more from wildfire smoke, VOCs, dust and more. Um, they also have radon control systems. This is the second cause of lung cancer right after smoking. And paired with smoking, it's a one-two punch. We have homes we've tested in EPA safe zones that still come back with high radon. So make sure for your clients you're installing these radon systems through April Air, both new construction and renovation. And you can help protect your clients uh, and learn more about all the different air quality uh, strategies they have over at AprilAir.com. And then thanks to our second tier sponsor for this session, Build Equinox Serve 2, the original smart ventilation system. Imagine a device that's constantly detecting air quality in your project and then only ramping up to, to uh, uh, make that air fresh and healthy when there's actual pollution in your air and not overventilating or underventilating. Made right in the United States of America, 100% solar powered factory. What more can you ask for? Check out buildequinox.com uh, today. So I'm really excited here. And before we get started, you know, this is a continuing conversation that we've been having at GHI about modular housing and how it fits into the green building movement. First, many of you might have seen me go live all the way back in 2018 at the Illinois Green Building Tour in the Chicagoland area, where I got to interview our good friend and um, uh, 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 member um, Tom Bassadilli. He had a modular project right there in the outskirts of Chicagoland going in, achieving uh, zero the DOE Zero Energy Ready program. So I got to go in and interview him, and we have the whole thing recorded on our YouTube channel along with some of the B-roll and drone footage of the install there. Very old project, but still ahead of its time, uh, so you can check that out. And then our board director, our friend Bill Spohn, the Spohn Home, modular net zero home right down in Pennsylvania, of course modular capital of the country. Uh, and we got uh, an invite to the back, uh, uh, back, back behind the scenes with our good friend, Bill, our board member, board director, Bill, and checked out his house and everything he did, as well as some images from the factory as well. So you can check that out on our YouTube channel. But really this session today is a follow-up and it took us about two years to get here, but I'm excited. This is a follow-up to a session we did with the one and only Ken Semler, if you haven't followed him on YouTube now and you want to get into modular, then go follow him right now. Offsite modular construction and how it fits in with residential green building. And really, you've kind of got these three aspects that we talked about in this session that I'll just summarize here today. First and foremost, you have massive waste reduction. It's so impossible to get builders to reduce waste on green building projects or any site built project. Part of it is not their fault. It's just the county's fault, right? The city, they don't provide uh, affordable recycling options in the community. They don't make it easy. The lights, the, the, the sites are too tight. So by doing modular day one, we're massively reducing 
uh, construction waste, which reduces carb embodied carbon as well. And so that's a huge benefit. So we talked about that during that session. We'll talk a little bit more about it today. Second, you know, you have a controlled site, right? It's just controlled. Um, and it's so the, 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 the products and materials are not being exposed to the elements and not getting damaged uh, like they might uh, offsite. So there's a lot of sustainability aspects to that there. And then lastly, if we can transform our modular industry to green, we can affect you know, thousands and thousands and millions of homes rather than trying to transform one by one small little builders all over the place. And so it can have a massive impact if we can make these transformation efforts. And so I'm super excited um, to hand it off to our speakers here today. And first up, we're gonna have um, Audrey from Offsite Dirt introduce a little bit more about the topic and then our speakers. And I'm super excited she helped us organize this session here today. And so uh, I'll hand it off and then we'll be back for Q&A after that. So Audrey, please take it away. Oh, thank you, Brett. I think we um, are obviously very excited to be here with the Green Home Institute. We're excited that people are interested in our industry of offsite construction. As you mentioned, um, my company is offsitedirt.com for information about offsite solutions, um, architect conversations, trends, technology, and all that good stuff. And then my company is Modular Serve Site. So I actually help consult on traditional builders and developers first project that's looking into getting into a so, uh, offsite solution. With that, we have met so many great people in the industry and we've brought them here today. We get to talk to modular architects of which are changing the way we define the conversation, the design and how it has trended from the beginning to where we are now. We have Matt McMullen and Erica uh, Chariva, I think I'm totally killing her name. It's um, Chariva Chavaria. Thank you. I am so sorry, okay. Erica. Okay. I even it's have okay. it written down here. They're with the Art of Construction. Um, Matt and his team has been designing for, I think, at least 15 plus years, something along that line. And he really has these great solutions with not only on site, but also incorporating off site as well. Um, we have Jeffrey Moreau, which is with Architect uh, Arteca Architects. And then we have Jetta McGregor, which is with MCM Architects. So first and foremost, just so everybody's clear and the topic that we're discussing, the biggest part of any modular project is really building your pre-construction team, which means everything from the site to the manufacturer to the end product. And the most important part of that is the design process and actually starting all of these pieces at the very beginning of the project where we meet these um, great people in the industry. So first I'm gonna start with Matt. He's gonna give us a little bit of, Matt and Erica, um, they're gonna give us a little bit of history about modular construction. Jeffrey's gonna go into some design elements and talk about factory design. And then Jenna's gonna kind of pull the whole thing about how modular design has, um, evolved and what trends are happening in the industry. So hopefully we'll have a lively discussion. Make sure to keep your questions for the end. We'd love to make sure we answer those. And thank you everyone for allowing us to be here. Matt, take it away. Hey, uh, thanks Audrey. And uh, thanks to Brett with GHI for inviting us to join you guys today and being on this great panel with us and other great architects. So uh, we, we're just gonna do a quick slide presentation. Eric and I are gonna kind of jump back and forth. And what we really want to talk about is sort of three topics. Offsite's not new. Uh, the second thing is volumetric modular is what we call architectural Jenga. Um, and then final thing is just offsite and onsite blending the two together in sort of an arts and crafts tradition. So offsite's not new uh, and customization and industrialization is not new. So what you're seeing here is a thing that I visited back in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, it was a Usonian home uh, that they erected uh, at the San Diego Museum of Man. And Usonian architecture was by Frank Lloyd Wright. Basically, you would take soil from the site, mix it with cement, and create these buildable uh, blocks that would allow you to build your own home. In the next slide, we'll see. Uh, Mr. Bucky Fuller, who I got to see when um, I was at the World Affairs Conference when I was a student at the University of Colorado Boulder. 
And Bucky showed up with these sort of things like the Dymaxion house um, and the next thing, uh, which you'll see, which is his uh, geodesic domes. Bucky was a pretty interesting dude. He showed up on stage and he had this sort of like aluminum silver suit on with these like little elf slippers that curled up at the end and a pointy silver hat. And so the dude was pretty eccentric. But what was interesting was that his idea was that you should be able to use these sort of uh, components and kit of parts to be able to put stuff together and then deliver it to different places around the United States and around the world. And so this is just an inside of, of a typical Dimaxian, Dima, or sorry, geodesic dome. And you can kind of see just what that looks like. There's still this, a few that still exist in Colorado. Hi everyone. So my name is Eric and I'm a, a project man manager and I work with Matt McMullen and uh, I wanted to touch on the arts and crafts movement just one of my favorite movements in architectural history. And that's because it really highlights the, the talents of the trades. And I would say too that that relationship between the architectural designer and the trades is very crucial to the success of a project of really creating a beautiful piece of art in my mind. And I think that one thing to touch on with, you know, new industrialization and new construction methods that we're seeing like modular and panelization and whatnot that this connection between uh, the trades and the architect does not have to dissipate and I feel like that's a question that gets brought up a lot if we want to go to the next slide please I think one thing to touch on is that the arts and crafts movement started at the end of the industrial revolution back in the late 1800s and what came out of that was this really customized, beautiful uh, trade talent, I'd say. And you're kind of seeing that again now. I mean, we have a lot of innovative construction methods that are really changing how we look at construction in general. And now I think it's time to kind of reiterate and reestablish a type of arts and crafts movement where we're reconnecting the trades and that customization and new modular construction methods. Next slide. And so I'm just gonna go through a couple projects that um, we've been working on and just some renderings as well. Next slide. So this is the Cusworth residence. This is a house in uh, Eagle County, Colorado, near Vail. And so this is a very difficult site. And we thought that this would be a really great opportunity for modular construction for the reason that with the intense grading going on here, there's a lot of engineering that has to go into this site as well as um, there's soil nailing, urban infill, bench grading as well. Um, and instead of having with such a tricky site that, you know, comes a lot of issues as well as, you know, dangers with on-site construction and without having to scaffold like a whole building to construct this with stick built, um, yeah, stick built methods, we now have the we now have the ability to build it like in a factory modular construction and just place these modules on top of a pre-engineered system. You're still getting this customization as well on the interior walking through this house and you would not know that this is a modular home. You have these big openings. We're still trying to connect the space very well. So there's a lot of potential with modular construction. It doesn't have to be so cookie cutter, which I feel like it gets a bad rep in that way sometimes. Next slide. And this is another house, um, Moss Togars in Grand County. And again, just another example of how we're taking a modular home and then on site, we're blending it with trades and their talents as well. You know, you're seeing these knee braces, you're seeing customized trusses to really create a beautiful custom home. Next slide. Next slide. So this is the uh, Eitzen residence, <clears throat> and it's up in um, Winter Park, Colorado, and uh, sits on the uh, <clears throat> on a lot at the fairways at Pole Creek, which is a golf course uh, up there. And so uh, one of the things you'll find is, uh, and we can kind of scroll through these pictures as I'm talking, but what you'll find is you'll be dealing with design review committees who are very used to stick built. These are high end homes anywhere in the three to $5 million range. And you'll have, um, things within the guidelines that 
may not necessarily prohibit modular construction, but certainly discourage it. And so you end up having to, uh, to create these uh, very detailed renderings that show stone that's being placed on site, um, uh, barnyard siding, uh, you know, recycled siding that goes on here as well too, to help the design review committee be able to get a feel that this really is a high-end home and um, is gonna meet the uh, standards that have been established in the community. And there'll be a shot here of the interior and really this house was based on if anybody's been to the old faithful lodge in yellowstone which is a, a multi-story space where you have these hallways that circulate around the outside of the rooms and look down into a central space and so this really is showing that the bedrooms are up on the second level you're looking down into the modules which get stacked like jenga where you have two story volumes looking down in on a central fireplace and then the final project we're going to show you guys is um, a senior independent senior living project that we're doing with the Archdiocese of Denver um, at Queen of Peace Church in Aurora. And what you'll see in the foreground there is a 90 unit independent senior living project. It's on a very tight site where one existing office building remains and three existing office buildings are being torn down and we're basically building this in the parking lot. And these will be a series of stacked modules that are five stories high with um, a rooftop deck here that you see that will be able to uh, capture the view across the valley, across Denver, and out to the front range of the Rocky Mountains. And so one of the things we've been talking with um, the owner about is why should Gen Xers and Millennials and Gen Zers get to have all the fun up on the roof? Uh, seniors should also be able to have fun on the roof. It'll just look a little bit different where there'll be some community gardens up here, potentially shuffleboard, um, some fire pits and things like that. And that really becomes the community area uh, up above. And with this project, we used a, uh, a software called TestFit. Um, and TestFit is a software that allows you to do site fits very quickly to figure out what maximum density you can fit on a site. Um, so if, if people are interested more about that, we'll post a link on the chat uh, and maybe even uh, in the Q&A to the Art of Construction podcast, you can go in there and listen to some of the leading technology folks that we interview on that podcast. I also just wanna highlight um, an, another pro I'd say towards you know modular construction methods is just based off my experience uh, working as a construction manager on a on a site um, for multifamily is when subs don't really have that relationship or experience of working together, there can be a lot of conflict that grows. And I think that modular construction really gives you a, a, like a, a community space within a factory where all of these different subs and trades can come together and really form a collaborative relationship where every project that they see coming through, they now have this groove of how to work together, how to really highlight their strengths in a controlled environment. And as we mentioned earlier, it really is architectural Jenga. Um, what you're doing is you're taking a series of boxes in volumetric modular and you're stacking these things together, creating positive and negative space, so voids that become decks or interior volumes that become great rooms. And then in the next slide, what you'll see is, we really think that the advantage is um, with modular is being able to use the factory for what it's best at, which is really creating uh, panels or volumetric modules um, in a very quick, efficient, collaborative space like uh, Erica was talking about. And then in the next slide, really taking craftsmanship because you know probably a lot of the GCs who are listening in know that it's been very difficult to keep craftsmen in the, uh, in the trades, uh, and especially to have that rejuvenation by young folk. They don't seem to want to go into the trades as much. So it allows you to absolutely be able to come in and use those folks to put the frosting on the modules once they're delivered to the site. And so that wraps up our, our thoughts. Thank you, Matt. That was perfect. Well said, and thank you for the walkthrough on that. Next, we have Jeff with Arteca Design, or Arteca Architects. Matt, take it away. Or Jeff, take it away and apologize. 
Not at all. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, hopefully you can see my slide. Um, I'm Jeff Morrill, principal of Artecta Architects. Uh, we work across the US in modular and conventional design. My uh, focus today is gonna to be in two parts. One, a quick overview of the modular industry <clears throat> and not to be redundant to um, AOC's uh, fantastic presentation by Erica and Matt, and uh, certainly uh, not to at all eclipse the, the great information that Jenna's gonna be presenting for us as well. Uh, let's see if I can get this guy to work for us. Oh, there we go. So here we go with the modular intro. So really what we're talking about in modular is something around 3% uh, of the overall building industry. It's uh, slowly climbing. I think we're technically uh, approaching about 5% at this time due to the explosion of the work on the uh, coastal regions. And just a quick look over here at uh, some highlights of modular. And these are, of course, some sell points by three different um, research institutes. Uh, Bashford, of course, uh, you can see a conventional build time analysis uh, versus modular for your residential home. Uh, you can see you trim off about 50 some days there. Uh, JD Powers, uh, we always hear them on the Ford commercials talk about customer satisfaction. The conventional tends to run about 64% customer satisfaction modular, very close to 90. Uh, it's based on a, a very broad research. I was surprised at uh, something in the range of like 10,000 uh, um, research points on that. And National Association of Home Builders, who is actually next week in Atlanta holding a uh, modular summit conference. I will be at that as well and available um, if you were to approach. And so uh, their uh, comparable cost modular shows a savings of about 18%. Um, so very quickly, <clears throat> this is uh, from another one of our colleagues, Abby Brown. Um, she has a great uh, textbook out there called Fabulous Prefab, and she points up, uh, you know, the time savings, uh, as you would see in the oval at the top there, uh, trimming off somewhere in that nature of about 50% overall. Um, I would be somewhat um, skeptical of 50%, but 40%. I would put money on that all day long. You can see on the oval at the side how um, that is a, a, a result of the manufacturing process uh, happening at the same time that you're working on the site, leading to that uh, overall uh, savings in time. So um, right here, <clears throat> this, this uh, interesting project was actually the Skyrise Terrace by Elmer Frey. Uh, this is not that far from our office, actually. It's long since um, gone back to the earth, as they would say. Uh, there was a tornado that helped all that happen, but this was actually uh, modular homes that were slid on top of a precast assembly um, back in the 60s. So here's a quick look at a, a few projects that we've worked on. Um, this is one that we did for Cincinnati Port Authority that would acts as the housing authority. Uh, just to give you a sense of the uh, you know, uh, overall uh, market ability of the various modular formats. So again, single family, this series of these, we built the factory for these and then deployed these units out. Uh, so this is one that is actually in construction right now. Uh, so these are uh, two family dwellings, twin homes, as some of you may know them, or duplexes. Um, and so this is uh, essentially workforce housing for uh, the Mille Lacs tribe over in Onamia, Minnesota. And uh, here you can see the mods in construction. These photos were taking, taken, pardon me, about uh, 45 days ago while the mods were in progress. Uh, that photo was taken uh, about two weeks ago as the mods were being stored uh, just adjacent to the site. You can see the foundations being constructed here approximately in that same timeline that the mods were being delivered. And uh, this photo was taken yesterday on site. And you can see uh, Roy in the foreground here um, working to get insulation along the rim joists. These are Energy Star homes that are part of a federal uh, energy grant um, working on a net zero or approaching net zero um, energy capacity. Um, and so uh, there are interesting things involved with that having to do with how the ducts have to be um, 
uh, sealed and so forth. There's a complete air test that's happening. And uh, just to point up in the background, you see this poor fellow up here in the corner. He is uh, getting ready to drop the halo over the top of this, which will then result in straps coming down either side. And this is actually the front piece, as you can see in the rendering right here next to it. So uh, this is a podium project that we did uh, quite some time ago, um, really got us on the radar with commercial work. Again, just to point up the various um, aspects of modular. So in construction, all these individual boxes set um, interstitial space over a precast um, podium. And this is what that looked like as it was getting close to done, not quite the finished product yet. Uh, and then getting a little bit bigger than those. So these are 936 plex buildings that are uh, going to be breaking dirt here before the end of the year um, over in La Mesa, Texas. Rather ambitious project. And one thing to point up about that is, so uh, Texas walk-ups, right? You're allowed three stories. You don't have to have an elevator. And one of the things that uh, we did with these floor plans is we unified uh, the dimensions across all of the grids so that uh, it, having a two bedroom on one side did not dictate that we had to have a two bedroom on the other side of the corridor. So we were able to mix in one, two, threes and efficiency units uh, very effectively without making any changes to the overall structure. Uh, so this is one of the larger ones that we've worked on. Uh, this one also hopefully will be breaking ground uh, this year. Um, it is somewhere in funding land, which is where all developers seem to find themselves at one point or another. And so this uh, fellow is a five over two um, wrapped mixed use with a centralized parking garage. And uh, it has 320 apartment units and is comprised of just shy of 500 box sets just on the south side of Dallas. So that'll swing us over to factory design. So <clears throat> obviously we do plenty of modular work. We've done about uh, maybe 18 modular projects across the US uh, since uh, 2008 was the first, not nah, 2006, pardon me, was the first one I did with this company, with Arteca. So we got into factories about a half dozen years ago <clears throat> that one we did for Cincinnati was one of the very first ones, which was a stall type, but we'll get to that. I'm going to focus really on uh, this portion of the uh, factory design process, which is, you know, really just getting that production line, the factory itself and incorporation of that workplace. So when we look at factories, <clears throat> you really determine what your production uh, type is going to be. And we'll see this demonstrated in just a moment. But uh, commonalities in all different factory layouts are, you have work areas, of course, you have to have material uh, areas, um, you have work in progress and right timing materials, um, in addition to bulk storage, of course, personnel areas, which includes um, any of your uh, administration, production, so on and so forth, office staff, uh, MEP areas, um, all the tools are run off of compressed air by and large, and there are other systems in place for uh, some of these factories. Subassemblies, which would include things like dormers, additional roof members, um, various other components. Oftentimes you'll see entire plumbing systems um, that are uh, pre-assembled um, and then uh, stockpiled for inclusion in a mod. Uh, factory features, somewhat self-explanatory site yard and traffic controls. So this particular one is um, going to be going up in central Florida this upcoming year. Um, so this does a nice little job of kind of laying out what a typical factory site looks like. Um, you can see we have the mod display homes at front. Everyone likes to see what's going on, stormwater retention, uh, parking areas for customers and employees separate from the truck yard itself. Um, so we end up with a gravel storage area by and large, um, certain municipalities. Um, we are working on a new factory um, that's looking like it'll be one of the largest in the United States um, in uh, part of Chicago. And Chicago is going to require us to pave all of our mod storage areas, which will be a nice little bill at the end of the day, but that's a different conversation. 
So you can see your phase one factory with the admin area. Um, so this is a little bit smaller. I mean, it's only 100,000 square feet or so. Um, 150 is a real typical size. Um, 200 is really where we're, we're tending to land, although you will find them all over the board. And you can see this one shown both in plan and implied in our rendering here um, for the phase one, get up and running once you're ramped up. Uh, ramp up time for a factory is probably close to a year. Um, and then you'll get into uh, you know, your phase two, hopefully, maybe that's year three to five out. Um, so that's a little bit closer look at what that uh, front is actually gonna look like. Here's a factory that we just opened up um, on the outskirts of Minneapolis. So this guy is about uh, 20,000 square feet of admin space uh, over here. And that is attached to approximately 180,000 square feet of production floor. So uh, this one was done by tilt up uh, walls, um, has a, a clear height of 28 feet to the underside of structure above, pardon me, there you go. Um, and here you can see uh, the underside of that structure, some of the overhead doors, the endless yards of uh, vapor barrier underneath there, um, front of the building coming in. Again, that's admin area. Here's the first run of mods. Um, this picture was taken uh, about three weeks ago. And so you can see uh, these mods are in construction for a mixed use uh, multifamily that we have going. Um, outside of Minneapolis. So anyway, uh, on to factory types here, just in brief. So a uh, stall type facility, essentially is green arrows and all slides are gonna represent material flow. And what we see is um, in a stall type, basically you've taken a small metal building, it could be 12,000 square feet, it could be a three stall garage, uh, you know, but uh, generally somewhere in that maybe 12, maybe 25,000 square feet. Um, and uh, one of our clients that we did a stall built for was building coffee kiosks. And that's all he was doing. It was a one-off thing. And so he took an old metal building, we converted that, and these are all coffee kiosks now. So he's knocking these out for this one particular um, franchise. And so you store your materials up here and then all the work is done on a trailer right here. You literally back up with the fifth wheel and hook onto it and pull these guys out. You're looking at a mod that, you know, typically you're no, no larger than like 12 feet wide by, you know, maybe 25 feet long, 30 feet long. Uh, again, maybe a small admin area. This might even be a totally separate building. Uh, next one, stepping up in size, you get to 100,000 square feet. So um, this area with this uh, rectangle is defining the overhead crane system, monorail or a bridge uh, crane system with interlocks. Um, again, materials flowing in. Now you start doing some right timing uh, with your materials, your sub-assemblies like fixtures and cabinets coming in. And you can see you start over here with your floor assembly, get your platform down. Now you're on um, what is either a trolley or air caster system, moving this way with those mods slowly, uh, you know, being erected, you know, floors, walls, then placing the ceiling. Ceilings and roofs will have a catwalk system overhead. You would have seen that at a glance in those factory pictures, that red um, catwalk system. And uh, then you're placing your final MEP, testing, pressuring, finishes, wrap and ship. And then you can see your production facility, cafeteria training, showroom, all that starts to become a little bit more involved. Same space here, but what you're doing is setting up for a 200,000 square foot factory. And this, this one leans towards that layout that has the uh, phased approach. So you could actually construct this self half, so to speak, of the building. And then at the appropriate time, more or less mirror the factory over and uh, be able to utilize certain functions already in place here and run two lines in parallel. So both of these are the same functions. And you can see again, much more involved in terms of the uh, individual stations. It takes approximately 45 um, separate construction activities or tasks to uh, build a mod. 
And, um, you know, obviously there's not 45 stations here. And so uh, what you would see is in any typical station of those 45, three or four happening at any particular station as they, they move along. <clears throat> I think, yeah, so here is a quick look. This is a factory down in Kansas um, for retrofit. And um, this particular guy, um, just points up that I, I kind of wanted to include at the end because a lot of people will take a look at like this big, uh, you know, warehouse building or they'll be like, oh, Amazon, you know, they're not going to do this warehouse. We've got this big empty building. Let's do a mod factory. And, uh, you know, like this space at first glance looks great. But then um, what we ran into, <clears throat> and I apologize for the scale of this, but uh, so this is our working drawing for the production line. And this is what's called a tail to hitch layout. So the floor and ceiling jigs or wall jigs, pardon me, are all happening here. And that flow is going again, tail to hitch around. For those of you that uh, you remember the Austin Powers movie with the uh, golf cart trying to move around in the, uh, or turn around in the hallway, right? So back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And so you can see these are the issues that we have, like they run really great. But at some point, you've got a 16 wide by 70 foot long, 35,000 pound box that you are jostling around. So looks are sometimes deceiving. Um, but that is that is how that happened. Those red little spots, there are columns that we actually took out in order to uh, facilitate the production line run. So. Um, that is the whirlwind tour. Um, thanks a lot. And I appreciate your time. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Brett, for hosting us today. I'll turn it back over to you. Thanks, Jeff. That was fantastic. Just quick question, Jeff. Um, somebody was asking about the Chicago factory. Where is that located or where are you working on in that one? Yeah, so that one is uh, more or less in the Chicago metro area. The uh, driver for that is um, workforce. We are looking to try and employ people and get um, people in, in the workforce that currently maybe are in uh, situations where those aren't, um, those jobs maybe aren't available. And I'm probably not at liberty to say a whole lot more than that right now. That's okay. We know, we get it. Jenna, you're up next with MCM Architects. Oh, you're yeah. muted. There you go. All right. Let me share my correct screen. There we go. Thank you so much um, for having me and for uh, letting me share a little bit with you guys. And uh, my name is Jenna McGregor. I'm a principal of MCM Architecture here in Dallas, Texas. Uh, we've been working with the modular industry for the last five years in the single family and multifamily markets. Um, and I just wanted to take a couple of minutes and briefly pull um, all of the information that um, the Jeff and Matt and Erica have shared with you. Um, so from concept to completion, this process um, is just like what um, Erica said, and it's, it's important to that the architect is fully connected with the trades from start to finish. Um, there's a lot of information that you share with the factory um, that you normally probably wouldn't have in communication with in like a traditional build sense with, with your contractor. We, we look at these more of a um, design bit, design build rather than a design bid build. Um, so this is what one of our factories has developed for us on a, on a future project we have and I just let it play in the background, but it's pretty neat watching them integrate our design and how they will build it in the factory, pull, pull it apart so that they can put it back together. Um, so shop drawings are actually submitted with the state submittal for permit, so the trades um, must collaborate during the pre-construction phase before the project ever hits the line or the job site. Um, the beauty in that is that your construction and client delays are significantly reduced and you're able to execute and ship um, and therefore those trades on site that are, are wrapping the skin, like what Matt was talking about, um, for they can execute those, those trades quicker on, on site because they know exactly what they're getting whenever that, that box hits the job site. Um, so moving it forward, it is important to uh, push the modular um, the modular scope. So I know 
a lot of people think of kind of the Clayton build, which is great. And if you get the two sides of the home driving down the road and you get it together and you stick it on, you stick it on a job site. And, and we started there and the fun in um, modular construction is okay. Now we know what our box is, but how do we break out of that box? Um, and so I think that's the challenge that we all get to have the opportunity to solve and um, pushing these factories to be more creative and work on the envelopes um, that are needed to, to maintain um, the, the regulations of the facades that um, some of these jurisdictions have on, on higher end homes. Um, but we also need to be very mindful of uh, maintaining the efficiency that modular is known for. Um, so here's just a couple of images that I can um, share with you uh, that we've done in modular construction um, in, in over the last five years or so. And so we're really trying to push, push our factories out of kind of the typical um, 15 foot four box and um, really, really seeing what they can do with it. So it's been a lot of fun over the last uh, two or three years, um, really breaking out of that shell. And that's all I have. Audrey. Thank you so much, Jenna, and thank you for showing those examples, because I think sometimes in our, our head, we think of it as one way, and now we can really see how much more collaborative, how much more beautiful, um, how we can reach different um, abilities to have a greener home or use more sustainable products. Again, just realize that modular is a form of construction, <clears throat> just like traditional construction. It's just built and designed a little bit different. So now I'm gonna give it back to Brett. I don't know if we wanna have um, a little bit of Q&A for our guests here today. It's an unusual circumstance to be able to get them away from their desk and their designs. So I'm happy to have them here. And I let's, let's, let's get the floor open and get people in here. Yeah, let's get some conversation going. Um, and you know, we've got four great questions lined up that I think to some extent we've been going through and answering, but maybe we can just kind of call them out and kind of hone back in on some of them and then we'll get to some of the questions from the audience which are tied into some of these questions and some of you've been doing a fantastic job of answering behind the scenes so I appreciate that so I'll just kind of you know throw this one out there and whoever wants to take it we'll go through a couple of you and then move to the next one so you know just overall and to the reason we're gathering here today for our architect friends who make up a big pool of the folks who tune in is you know, how is architectural design of modular offsite construction, you know, different? We, we talked a lot about some examples, but let's just sort of reiterate some of those key points on where the difference lies, um, you know, for the designer, for the architect. Oh, I can jump in first. Um, you know, one of the things that uh, having a long background in stick built construction um, the thing that uh, when I transitioned over to modular, <clears throat> all of a sudden realized that basically you're dealing with a gridded system. And um, so it's it's more commercial in that aspect because, you know, with uh, with multifamily and commercial buildings, you're actually using grids here. All of a sudden now we're using grids in residential, which allowed us to identify modules. And so then the second piece was going in and, and dealing with the factory and figuring out what is their sweet spot for their modular widths what are their maximum links? And once you have that, you're able to create sort of a grid over the site and start to design over the top of that. So it's sort of like restrictive, yet it frees you at the same time. Um, I throw it to Jenna to, to add. No, that's a great, that's a great um, response. And I, I think it's the same, as long as you know the requirements and the, the limitations, then, you're, you're free to move beyond that. Um, and so I, I love looking at architects designs and figuring out how to modularize them, so to speak. Um, and it's, it's really not as difficult as I think people might imagine initially. Are, are there any, just to follow up on some of that, are there specific courses anyone has taken or recommendations for designers and architects to get into this? Um, I would just say the first one is to go to your factory and really talk to them because a lot of it, what, what it depends on is Department of Transportation rules, so USDOT, but then you have, you know, like we work in several different states, so you have Colorado Department of Transportation, you have Texas Department of Transportation, et cetera, and, and you'll have, I mean, it really kind of gets down into the weeds where all of a sudden if you, 
you know, say you're, you can go greater than 15 foot too, but now all of a sudden you have a pilot car and you have a lead car or a pilot car and a trail car, and that increases costs and shipping is not inexpensive right now. So it's all those little sort of things. I mean, I'm not familiar with any sort of modular classes. There may be uh, some that exist out there. I just haven't run into them yet. I think we all just jumped in with both feet and figured it out. <laughs> but I, I would agree with Matt. I We typically like to work to 90% on a basic knowledge of what, what a factory is requiring, keeping within a certain space for transportation. But then you also need to find that factory and team up with them. And that's when the collaboration really gets going. You have your shop drawings that you coordinate with. Um, and so all of those parts and pieces get put together before anything's ever built because their, their equipment, the factory that you select, their equipment might be different. And, and so they can't run a 75 foot box. Maybe they're at 30 foot boxes. So you, it's really important to, before you solidify hard line your drawings to find a factory, get them in, get pricing, get on their line and then integrate um, integrate your design with their system. And I think one important thing to add to that, just what, what Jenna said is that length of the box really depends on your site. And so what we'll do is, you know, thank God for Google Earth, is that we'll go in and you'll work, sometimes they'll have a specific logistics person that will look and see whether you can get a crane in and what's the maximum length of box that you can get in due to hairpin turns or, or tight neighborhood streets or things like that. We had a one project on Barker Reservoir outside the Boulder where we could only get a 35 foot box in there because they had these incredibly tight hairpin mountain turns. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. We had that problem with our, our Winter Park project. It, they had to go through Nebraska and around the mountain range from uh, where they were coming from because they couldn't make it up the pass that we all we all know and love. So, so it, and partially it sounds like maybe the answer is, uh, you know, if the question is, hey, I'm an architect, I'm a designer, I want to get ready for modular. Really, it almost sounds like you're not just going to get ready for modular and then go find someone to work with, but really the other way around. You want to have that partnership in place. Um, you know, Jeff, from a factory standpoint, you know, what do you like to see when architects and designers are coming in to, to work with you? Yeah, well, um, just a couple of points. Um, so we actually do production drawings out of our facility too when we're starting up a factory. Um, and so I, I would only make that point to underscore uh, Jenna's comment about working with the factory and the production drawings because uh, you really, every factory, there every factory I've ever been to um, and all the factories that we've, we've done and are working on all have their own unique systems. Um, you won't find any two factories that really do what would seem to be the same detail the same way. And, and so you've really got to make that, that connection um, first. Um, and then, uh, uh, wait, what was your question? <laughs> There's so many questions going on here. Well, it, it, the, the main question is, you know, the difference between, um, you know, design or between modular and site for architecture. But then my question specific to you is just, you know, what are you looking for from these designers and these architects if they're going to be working with you as a factory, someone from the factory as a, standpoint? As a factory rep. Yeah. So, um, well, I would say that if you're interested in getting into modular design, <clears throat> for example, and, and I guess maybe what really cued me into talk about those production drawings is, is um, we can work as the AOR um, or we can work as a modular architect and um, there'll be a separate architect of record. And so um, just because an architect maybe isn't familiar with uh, modular, maybe they have that opportunity, know that there are architects out there um, that are experienced and uh, can collaborate on that. Um, it is a uh, it's a tricky venture um, to think that you're going to uh, you know you have a great client and they say I want to do a five over two um, mod project and you haven't done modular previously. Um, that's sort of like asking an architect that has never worked on a hospital to design a hospital. 
Um, so, you, uh, and I, I don't mean that to affront anybody or, or try to, in, in fact, I would certainly encourage people to go into modular, um, but it um, is definitely a beast unto itself. And um, so uh, I think that the, the point has been made that uh, you connecting with the factory is um, really the number one place to start. And in fact, if someone is inclined um, to get into modular, if you can make that connection, a lot of factories are searching for architects because they'll have projects that come along, multifamily projects, so forth, that'll more or less walk through their door. And they don't necessarily have staff architects. In fact, it's more of a rarity that that um, factories have on staff architects and engineers. They tend to utilize um, third party like NTA and PFS is uh, got just a couple of the companies out there who provide third party review of the drawings. And um, then in the factory also provide um, third party inspections of those mods, but they're not, uh, you know, architect of record, engineer of record type um, uh, companies offering those services. So um, that's where if someone's inclined, reach out to those factories and, and be, be pleasantly surprised. And, and just to add on to that, everybody's asking, is there a list out there? Where can I find modular factories? So the first thing is wherever your project's located in that state, that's the very first place to start the conversation. But here's the unique thing about modular factories. Each one of them designs and builds differently. Not all modular factories can do multifamily. I would say 80% of those factories are doing just single family. So you have to be selective and do your research or contact me and let me help you because I have relationships with over 200 different types of factories. Um, and here's another thing, it might not, volumetric or modular construction may not be your solution. Lots of people on the panel um, and lots of people in the notes are looking for a sustainable product and a panelized product. There's panelized um, products that are um, energy efficient that are going into another factor of offsite solution. So it really depends on what is the focus of your project? Where are you leaning it in? Um, these, all these people that are on our panel have learned through just being so eager and actually talking to the different manufacturing plants and learning their systems and then finessing that to the next level. And so I wanna keep um, uh, a conversation going here on this design aspect. And there was a really good question that came in uh, and I want to expand on the question. You know, the question that came in was, hey, what renderings systems or software were you using? I think you answered it, Matt. But I want to expand on it for our architect friends. You know, what tools and programs and anything can they start using? What ones are better? Or is this back to sort of the plant question, really, at the end of the day, like, you know, whatever the plant tells you to use? So uh, I don't know if you want to try to take that one, Matt, since you did answer that question first. Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, when I joined Outer Construction, you know, it was a Revit-based, um, you know, uh, company. And so uh, previous to that, I'd worked with ArchiCAD, and ArchiCAD has BIM six, uh, BIMX, which is a real-time rendering software. Um, Inkscape, uh, I believe, is a little bit more robust. Um, and if people are interested, you can go into our podcast at theartofconstruction.net and listen to some podcasts on, on Inkscape where we interviewed the founder and, and uh, users, including like Overland Architects down in San Antonio, Overland Partners. But the, the beauty of uh, the Inkscape program is that it is real-time rendering. So you can make changes on the fly when you're in a, a meeting with a client and have those things show up immediately. Um, the other thing is uh, just to talk about Revit as a platform, is most factories that we worked with, I've transitioned away from AutoCAD and into Revit, which is pretty valuable because then you're able to uh, see the module volumetrically and they're able to do quantity takeoffs, mm -hmm. which is really the beauty of BIM, building information modeling, is that you're able to do quantities on OSB and, and other things if you model it correctly. Any other thoughts on that? tools and resources for architects and designers? I use the exact same tools. I use Enscape and Revit, so I mirror that comment. 
<laughs> yeah. Other thing is if there is, if there are any developers out in there test and you're doing multifamily, I would highly recommend that you look into test fit. They've got a, um, as we mentioned, they have a one for uh, office space. They have one for hotels. They have one for multifamily and they just came out with a new one called subdivision configurator, which allows you to come in and do layouts uh, for uh, intentional communities and subdivisions, which is pretty efficient. Great. Um, well, we're going to stick around because there's a lot of questions and we're going to keep answering some more questions here. Um, but before we do, I know we're getting closer to our time. So I just want to remind everybody again um, that yes, this session is being recorded. And um, one of the places you can watch it is on our YouTube channel. So you can go there in a week or so to grab the recording, or you can go there now and subscribe and get access to that. And then for those of you wondering who are watching this in the future, not right now, on demand, head over to the Thinkific channel or the USGBC platform and take your quiz with an 80% passing rate, and then you will receive your continuing education certificate. Those of you watching this live right now who have been here for the entire approved CEU time and who've been appropriately logged in, you will receive your certificate of approval. Uh, check your spam in the next couple of days from certs at Gutenberg certs. Dot com. And yeah, we're going to hang out and keep answering some questions again before we get to all those questions coming in. I just need to say a big thanks to our board of directors, our volunteers, our executive director, Jose Reina, our nearly 250 members all across the planet, as well as our top tier sponsors, Mitsubishi, um, April Air, um, Ream, just to name a few. They all allow us to do what we do and they have high performance products that are going to help you build more sustainable um, uh, better, uh, better project. So um, one of the last questions that we had on our list, and, and I want to give you all, this is your chance to just, just get it out here. And I don't know how many code officials we have joining us, how many city officials we have joining us. There may be a few, so this is their chance to, to, to push back, but this is your chat, you know, and this is one of the questions I think we had lined up, like, what is it that's getting in the way? of modular. I know it's very specific down to the street sometimes, the city level, the county level, the state, but what do you what do you want to tell these code officials who are making these rules or are, like the state of Michigan we're updating to 2050 uh, 2021 hopefully international energy code, international construction code. What do you want to tell state of Michigan, you know, when we're updating, how do we make it easier for modular and not stand in the way because I know a lot of times uh, unfortunately, our codes and our municipalities stand in the way of this. And, you know, what do they need to know? Well, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, well, the, the, the issue that we're having in Colorado is really just capacity. Um, the, uh, the code officials, and we're working in, you know, multiple municipalities are, are really good and they really understand it. There's reciprocity, mm. like our, our modules in Colorado are built in Nebraska and there's reciprocity between the state of Nebraska and the state of Colorado. Um, but the issue is really capacity is you're starting to see, and, and, and Jeff showed the 3%, that's starting to increase where we're getting more and more people who really wanna try modular. And so there's this sort of um, a push of projects going into the state of Colorado housing division. and um, so while the individual municipality is relatively well staffed, the state of Colorado Housing Division is not staffed well. They've got like one or two people that are reviewing all the modulars, including multifamily projects coming through there. So we actually had a conversation with the governor's office about, hey, there's a, there's a title shift that's coming your way. You guys might want to staff up. Um, but yeah, I don't have any complaints in terms of acceptance of modular at all. Um, folks have been great to work with. They really understand it. I've actually yeah. faced different, Sorry, no. I'm sorry. I've actually faced a different problem. In Colorado, the local jurisdictions love it. They're used to it. Um, here in Texas, it's a little bit in the smaller towns. They've, they've pushed us back. Um, they don't understand it. They want to see it. Um, we have a whole other licensing program, TDLR, that has to inspect come and inspect at the factory level. Um, and so we've we've been sitting down with a lot of the smaller jurisdictions and it's showing them 
what it, I mean, our, our plan sets, our, our review, um, and really educating them to, to allow us to build this product and, um, and show faith in us that, that we, that we are putting a valuable product in their, in their town. Um, and once they see it, they love it and they're sold and it, it's, it's an immediate turnaround, but, um, that if, if you're the first, if you're the first project to go into your town, you might be facing a little bit of an uphill battle, but if you just go in and educate, um, then, uh, I, we haven't had anybody turn us down. So that's been good. Yeah, I was just going to say people confuse modular construction with manufactured housing. Um, both of them are built under different uh, building codes. Modular is built under the same IRC code, International Residential Code, as traditional builds. So like Jenna was saying, if it's a new town, a new little uh, municipality, education is always key. And it's just like what we're learning here. Um, how do we discuss it? How do we move it forward? And what are the pieces that we have to pick up to understand and educate ourselves with? Yeah, maybe if, if I could just um, add on to that, that same note, because both of those are such great and accurate points. That, and the education certainly is, is an issue. And to uh, Audrey's um, astute observation that, yeah, the I, IBC and IRC still apply. I saw there was a question having it. Uh, to do with, you know, if there's a special set of codes and so forth. And the, the simple answer for the code official on site is no, it's it's still, if it's multifamily, it's IBC, if, you know, single or, or smaller, um, you know, uh, duplex and so forth, it's just IRC. Um, there really is no special recognition of that. <clears throat> there, there are state codes that talk about industrialized buildings. And that that kind of lends its, itself back to the fact that the state um, actually has authority to um, provide the third party inspections. Um, and that's either delegated to one of those other agencies I mentioned before, or actually performed by state employees in some instances. Um, and and the, the thing is that, you, you know, now you've got this um, thing that you know, is sort of like a dishwasher, right? Like it's built in a factory and it's wrapped and it has an owner's manual that goes with it and you're bringing it on site. Now, someone's going to live in that product. And the issue that we often run into is the local guy doesn't like it when you say, I'm not going to take that wall apart to show you that plumbing connection. That's already been improved by someone at the factory um, through that state authorization. So, so, so there is a little bit of that friction, but again, um, I think Jenna hit it spot on, you know, let's talk about that education, uh, component and, and, you know, just really bridging that, uh, communication. Um, that's what, it, that's what it's all about. And once they, once they see it, they, 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 they tend to love it. Yeah. But yeah. And, and I, and I think, yeah. Thing. And on top of that, the reason why people are moving to modular or why we're kind of in this conundrum of what, why are we doing this and where are we going is because we're trying to repeat the same design possibly, especially in um, multifamily over and over and over again to assist the developer. You can change the outside, you can change the skin, maybe configure the building a little bit differently, but it's the repetitive source. And that's where the savings and your team is already designed. The plans are already completed that you keep duplicating it. And that's where the efficiencies of modular volumetric come in on that level. And I was just gonna say one final thing to the, on the financial side, <clears throat> the project uh, Queen of Peace Independent Senior Living Project is a HUD 221D4 project. And if you're gonna use modular for a HUD project, you need to get special approval for that. So just a word to developers and, and owners out there as you might, be specific paperwork that you have to fill out and get approvals before you can go down the modular route. Well, I'm glad you brought up financing that, you know, I was going to ask another question, but let's just go with that. You know, what are, um, you know, our, our banks, our lenders, our underwriters, our appraisers, you know, what are they doing with this when it comes their way? Uh, is it easy to get financing or are they like, I don't know what this is. I don't know what to do with it. Cause I know when it comes to green, when we don't have the lenders and the appraisers on board, we don't get the value and it's such an impediment and it's such a misunderstanding. And I have to imagine there's even more confusion, maybe not on the modular side, but uh, I would just be curious what, what you all are experiencing there. Well, they like to kind of answer the question separately on the, on the, the green side in valuation. Oh, um, you don't have to answer that. I'm, I was making oh, okay. a statement there. 
Uh, but I was saying financing for modular uh, and appraisers understanding how to appraise mm -hmm. it and, you know, how, what are some of the challenges? Are there banks who are sort of friendly to this that, you know, you don't have to name them off, but is it like, oh yeah, they're friendly. They're going to make this easy for you. <laughs> yeah. No, so there were probably maybe when we first started, maybe three or four banks and they were all smaller banks um, that were in more sort of rural communities who really understood it. But now it's, our clients are getting, you know, loans from, you know, standard banks, you know, Wells Fargo, First Bank, you know, uh, Key Bank. So yeah, literally anybody. It's uh, it's really changed in the last two to three years. And the larger thing. projects. Um, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeffy. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just, no. I, yep. I was just going to um, add on to that too. That when you think about the financing and the appraisal portion of it, the one challenge that we have um, isn't isn't really from the peer financing side. You know, to Matt's point, I mean, I, I think that's mainstreamed enough that that's not an issue. But um, the numbers that we sometimes get um, when bidding the projects tend to be skewed. Uh, so it should be broadly 80% of the work completed by the factory, 20% of the work completed on site. So your bid from your on-site contractor should, should be about 20% of what their typical full would be because all that work's been done in the factory. I'd like to say that uh, I'm just saying it for effect, but we've truly seen bids that are like 80%. It's like you, they're backwards. It's like that's the amount that should come off, not not be uh, the bid amount, and and so that is the issue that we run into with financing and um, you know some of those projects that are caught in funding land is because it, especially as they get bigger and and more complex, you know you have five and six hundred box sets that are happening around the U.S. right now. Mm. The the list of contractors and entities that are qualified to take on that project is substantially smaller than the general contracting entities that are out there that could do it conventionally. So, um, so there's challenges um, from that side too. And we would definitely encourage anyone in the contracting side that's listening here today to, uh, to, to jump in, give me a call, give, give anyone on the panel a call. We'd, we'd love to get more people in the pool. I think you just found our next mo uh, modular session, a uh, modular <laughs> session for the site supervisor for the general construction. I think uh, I'm going to write that down and, and I think we're going to do it. So thanks for that one. Um, so, you know, getting into the building science, that's why a lot of folks are here. You know, there's this question I want to elevate and talk about and then get into some other building science questions. But, you know, what is the group's preferred, uh, I think in this case, preferred method of insulating exterior walls? And you, we can talk about insulation in general. Is there a preference of in cavity versus continuous? Are there any downsides um, when dealing specifically uh, with like taping joints, seams? And then maybe just especially considering travel, does that damage insulation of certain pipes at all? I think you have to look at all of those pieces individually and then mm. gauge what what the best use for your product is. Mm -hmm. um, if, if you have a factory that's willing to do a plan for you, but it's a little farther outside of kind of where you'd want to go. Um, I mean, you're really not wanting to ship these too far down the road um, because then you're more, you're opening yourself up to more breaks and um, drywall and glass, things like that. You will have to kind of prepare for that in your structural design. Uh, but overall, like a modular construction is built um, with more material, more product, um, more insulation um, than a traditional um, traditional home because it does have to be able to transport down, down the highway without kind of breaking down on you and they're all individually um, constructed. Um, insulation wise, I think um, there's there's benefits to both depending on the region that you're that you're building in. Any further thoughts on that one at all? It's pretty. Yeah, we're uh, you know we're packing the cavities <clears throat> with uh, with loose insulation and then using uh, continuous insulation over the exterior mm. uh, as well to to meet the new IECC codes. Sure. Um, and then we, there were several questions in the Q&A as I just continue to look at it. And thanks to everybody for sending those in. 
um, about Passive House. And so there's a consultant, uh, EMU uh, Passive Systems in Colorado that we've worked with. We have not been successful of getting um, one out of the ground yet, but we continue to explore systems. So we're not we're not there yet. You really need to get the factory on board to to meet Passive House standards, but we're working on it. Yeah, and scaling back a little bit from Passive House, um, you know, I see the Inflation Reduction Act is releasing, I don't know, 2,500 for um, manufactured Energy Star certification. I know Energy Star certifies full plants. I'm tra tracking down Energy Star to actually do a session on that as well. Um, have you all seen anything or do you know anything on, on how that might happen, how people can you know, take advantage of these funds and get man, uh, Energy Star certified products out of the plant? Uh, I could maybe field that one right off the get go. So we're working with a couple of plants that are Energy, Energy Star certified products um, already. And really to what Jenna commented on, um, the quality of the building products that are put in, um, you know, the, the volume of the insulation, the um, amount of material, you're generally putting about 20% more material um, in a mod than you are in a conventional stick build. But the, the point of that being, um, so those um, twin homes that I had in my particular area of the presentation, those are all Energy Star certified. Um, and that is a requirement of the Minnesota housing uh, that is part of, part of the funding package. Um, it's actually, it's a LIHTC project. And so we have a few different sources flowing in for that mm -hmm. one. Um, and so really it's a matter of just approaching um, the factories for them to get certified through Energy Star is, you know, the typical bureaucratic hoops and loops, but um, a, a number of factories across the U.S. I'm positive are um, because we have just more or less stumbled across them. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a thing. It's, it's like the dishwasher, you know, it's NSF certified and Energy Star friendly. Right. Um, some questions in here about unions and jobs, you know, just kind of merging them together a little bit. You know, there was one of our members who was concerned about modular taking away local jobs. Another person here was saying, you know, construction unions opposing some of this offsite stuff, maybe for the exact same reason, maybe not. They didn't really specify. What can you say to, you know, talk about local job creation, uh, concerns about construction unions, um, you know, when it comes to the increase of modular housing. Maybe, maybe I'll take this one just to start. Uh, so the typical factory that we're putting up is employing approximately 300 people on the floor. And anywhere from, uh, you know, I mean, obviously it depends on the size of the factory and the exact product, but uh, you're looking at somewhere in the range of maybe 40 to 80 people in the production side in terms of the, the admin, um, drafters, all the other uh, folks that are not actually constructing in a factory. So if you got a 200,000 square foot factory, you're putting about 300 people uh, into jobs there. And, you know, these factory jobs <clears throat> are, they're, they're good paying, they're, they're carpenters, like a lot of the guys that, and I should say people, like of all genders, right, uh, that we see in the factory, are carpenters or whatever trades they were in. And they just sort of got tired of being out in the rain or the cold or whatever, mm -hmm. and decided I could be over here. Uh, the income is great. The benefits are great. And I wear a t-shirt, you know, 365 days out of the year. Um, these are air conditioned, heated spaces. Um, and I, I think that which directly having spent a couple of years framing in North Dakota full time, I can tell you that when you've got three pairs of gloves on, that nail isn't going in as straight as you think it might. So, um, you know, there's there's a quality control issue there. And I mean, when you look at that, so you had one factory that typically has a distribution. Now, of course, as Matt mentioned, you have units that are coming in, you know, across multiple state lines. In fact, one of the distributors is kind of right in my local, just out of Fargo, is um, shipping uh, Fairfield in and Suites, a modular project out to uh, the Snowmass area in Colorado. 
right? Like that's that's happening. So they're going across multiple state lines, but most factories, especially the wood ones, kind of tend to stay within maybe that 500 mile radius at the most, because you do start getting some road loss. I mean, you can only drag a box so far. Um, but, uh, you know, with that said, so if you think about 300 jobs and you think about how many tradespeople are in a metro area, like how many carpenters do you think are in Chicago, right? And we're going to have 300 of them, uh, you know, in these various trades in a factory. I mean, is that really depleting the force? Is that really, in my mind, that is creating more energy and more velocity for the overall construction atmosphere and the environment. And I think, I, I just think that the modular factories uh, just provide another avenue that is cost effective and meaningful and efficient. And it's, it's just another option out there. Um, and I don't see it as a black and white or a, a matter of, um, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, of uh, not uh, of confrontation or having to choose one. I think they both build on each other. Matt made a great point at the onset, and as did Erica talking about the blending of the on-site and off-site to create truly great architecture at the end of the day. Yeah, like Jeff said, I think it's, um, I love it when I go into a factory and it's nasty outside. And I say to the lead framers, I'm like, don't you guys wish you were outside today? They're like, no, dude, we are done with that. But I think, you know, to, to reiterate that point, I think what it really does is it allows, instead of just being sort of production commodity folks as tradespeople, it really allows them to be crafts people where they are, you know, more finished carpenters than they are just rough carpenters. Because I don't, I don't think that's the best use of their skills. Yeah, yeah, great points. And, you know, I was thinking about this outside issue that you, you guys bring up. And I, I'm curious, you know, how much work was lost over this summer across the country as we continue to break heat records uh, or how much work should have been lost to protect worker safety? You know, there's always that trade off. Did, were people overwork, you know, and, and, and hopefully, you know, cities will crack down and make sure people are not overworked in the construction industry. But we can only anticipate things to continue to unfortunately get hotter. And it's going to, you know, slow our economy down for outdoor projects. So what ways then does, you know, indoor construction help keep that going? Is it safer to do inside construction during heat waves? Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that overall? I'll, I'll be very brief on this one, but yeah, factories are, uh, obviously run by, uh, OSHA standards. And you think about guys getting up on 12 foot ladders, um, you know, to set rafters, um, and they're up on scaffolding multiple stories high for conventional framing, just thinking of your, your typical, maybe three to five story mm -hmm. wood multifamily structure. Um, that is a very dangerous and precarious situation sometimes. And instead, uh, yeah, you're, you're putting together mods that have catwalks, um, you know, secure platforms, everything is being done right there at the ground level. Your walls are being handled by um, power overhead crane systems by multiple people. Um, much safer. I will uh, do what I can to dig out. I know I've seen them, but I don't want to cite incorrect numbers, but there is a comparison of uh, typical worksite safety by OSHA incident versus the mod factory. I do know it's significantly lower in a factory setting. For those that have never been in a modular factory, I highly recommend you finding one near you and calling them up and going and taking a tour. It is, it's pretty neat if you haven't if you haven't seen it in person. And I was going to say, I don't think I've ever been in a factory where I've seen guys standing up on the roof with a four by eight plywood sail uh, and being worried that they're going to get lifted off the top of the roof. So <laughs> good point. Yeah. Um, and you're also just to reiterate, when you're doing a modular project on site, whether it be multifamily or single family, these buildings are going up within days, not months. Some of them are going up within hours. 
So again, you don't have all those trades going in and out of the work job site. They're all orchestrated in an organized build schedule in -hmm. order to keep the efficiencies moving forward. Mm -hmm. Um, For folks listening who are interested in mid to high rise multifamily, um, is modular available? You know, the question that kind of came in here from one of our members, they were saying they couldn't find any services above three stories. Um, you know, how high is modular going to get? Um, is it possible to do these larger um, mid to high rise projects? Right now it's restricted uh, by the construction type and the IBC. So you can do a five over two podium. Technically that's seven stories. Uh, but it's five stories uh, that Chloe that we put up. That's an example of that. There are several others um, across the U.S. right now that are are similar. So that's the restriction is the IBC. There are uh, metal high rises. So you get into metal um, construction, mm-hmm. steel construction, which tends to be different factories. You very rarely would see one factory producing wood and steel. Um, they're just different animals. So. Uh, the steel factories, mm. um, there are some in the U.S., and they're good. Uh, ZMOD is out there. They're down in the southeast U.S., um, many others. Uh, so with the steel, um, yeah, 20 stories, why not? Uh, so it's really more of a material challenge than, than the, the actual factor itself, and, and it's because, okay, because they use metal, so... Uh, and that's that's a that's an international building code you're referencing that limits that size again, right? Um, well, we are um, you know coming up on our time here, and um, you know I'm going to send out to you all some of the further questions that we might have that really kind of get into specifics. But I think we've got through most of them. Maybe what I'll do next, Audrey, is you can just kind of guide us through, and everyone can you know, again, reference where people can go to contact them or learn more if they'd like to. So I'll, you know, I'll start with you and then we can go from there. So. Yeah. So I wasn't sure who we were talking. <laughs> I was saying, Audrey, if you, can, if you, if you, uh, if you want to just start, where can people go to contact you, learn more if they like, and then if you want to take us through uh, we'll just go through everybody else and go from there. So, <laughs> Okay, uh, Matt, you're up. Go for it. <laughs> All right. Hey, so uh, thanks to everybody. <clears throat> Great questions. Um, it, it, we really enjoyed being on this panel, and, and thanks to my other uh, panelists here uh, yeah, and Audrey for, for putting this together. Um, you can reach us. Um, you can reach me at Matt, M-A-T-T, at the AOC.us stands for the art of construction. You can reach Erica at E R I K A at the AOC.us. Um, give our podcast a listen. Um, we've got about like over 500,000 listeners. Um, it's a blast. We interview people on Cutting Edge. Uh, Jeff is going to be on here uh, shortly. We're going to talk about it when he's in town here in a couple of weeks. Uh, so, um, Thank you to everyone, and please reach out to us. Happy to answer your questions. Yeah. Jenna, Jenna, go ahead. Oh, Sorry, Jeff. (laughs) Thank you, everybody, for having us on the call today. This was really great. Um, It was also nice to hear Matt and Erica and Jeff's uh, input as well. So um, this is a big community. Everybody's in Mm -hmm. to help one another. So um, if you do have a project, please reach out to one of us. Um, and we can help you, guide you in the right place um, and get a modular project started for you. Um, Another uh, resource that I would recommend if if you're into these is um, going to the World of Modular. Um, It's a convention every year and this upcoming year, it's in March, it's in Vegas. So um, could be a lot of fun. So um, I know know Jeff was at the one in San Antonio last year. Um, so yeah, thank you guys very much. Reach out to me if you have any questions. My email address is Jenna, J-E-N-N-A, at mcmarc.com. Thank you guys. All right, Matt. All right, Jeff, you're up. 
Great. Yeah. Well, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate your time today. And yeah, my name is Jeffrey Morrill, principal of Artecta Architects. Um, as uh, Jenna mentioned, there is a world of modular. You can also check out MBI, the Modular Building Institute, great resource, uh, openly available. And you'll find most of us are members of that. I'll be over hanging out with Matt in Denver uh, in just a week or so. Um, and so uh, at that time, there's actually what's called the uh, Offsite Construction Expo, the OSCE, which occurs about every three months or so across the US. So a great one that's probably within driving distance of any metropolis that you, you happen to be at. Um, you can reach me at my email, jm at artecta.com. And uh, my other contact information is, is likewise available in the chat. Thank you. Thank you, everybody, for your interest. Thank you, Brett and uh, GHI, for allowing us to be here having this conversation. As you have seen, these are some amazing humans that also are in modular construction. And uh, my name's Audrey Grabesic. You have my contact in the chat. Love to answer any questions. Like Matt, um, Art of Construction podcast is really amazing. Um, Offsite Dirt also has about 100 and some videos of people from coast to coast talking about all things offsite. So hopefully we're here to help and be of service to you. And we'd love to have you come into our area of business. We'd love to have you. So thank you. All right, great. Uh, Audrey, Jenna, Matt, Jeff, Erica, thank you all so much for your time. It was good hanging out, learning a lot. Um, thanks for all of you who joined us. Take care, stay safe, stay well out there. We'll see you um, here next week. Goodbye. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.